SpaceX is moving closer to Starship Flight 12, with both the ship and booster assembled and preparing for ground testing. In the previous episode, we pointed out that scaffolding had been erected around the Flight 12 upper stage, Ship 39, extending nearly to the nose cone, with access planks concentrated above the payload bay, strongly suggesting teams were working specifically in the nose cone heat shield area. Now, Nearly two weeks later, the scaffolding was removed, revealing clear evidence that the work targeted the heat shield tile attachment hardware. Starship's thermal protection tiles are not simply bonded ceramic panels. They are mechanically retained using specialized hardware with multiple retention points per tile depending on local load environments. Accessing those pin interfaces without cracking tiles typically requires precise marking and controlled drilling. On Ship 39, one side of the tiled nose region now shows markings around pin locations, and several of those points appear drilled and filled with a white material. Despite what looks like classic tile extraction preparation, no tiles have been removed so far, and the scaffolding removal suggests SpaceX is not starting a large-scale tile pull on this vehicle. The same pattern has also appeared on Ship 40 inside Star Factory, including numbered labels and similar white fill material at drilled locations, again without any visible tile removal. That creates a clear contradiction. The markings resemble removal prep, yet the follow-through does not match an active replacement campaign. Since the pin interface was clearly accessed, the most likely explanation is retention system rework, modifying the pin region itself, rather than swapping tile panels. This interpretation fits Starship's re-entry risk profile because heat shield retention remains one of the most failure-sensitive systems. Losing even a single tile can expose stainless steel structure to hypersonic heating, potentially leading to burn-through or local loss of stiffness. The drilled and filled pin regions could indicate an incremental retention upgrade, such as tightening pin entry tolerances, adding a sealing compound to reduce hot gas intrusion behind tiles, or limiting micro motion under ascent vibration and re-entry flexing. The white material is likely a sealant, filler, or high temperature stabilizing compound. Notably, Ship 39 shows this change only on one side of the nose cone, which fits SpaceX's usual approach of testing a modification on one section first, and then comparing tile cracking, loosening, or loss rates after flight. Meanwhile, Ship 40 could be getting the full treatment if this tile pin modification represents the new retention standard. On the booster side, Booster 19 is fully stacked and being readied for cryogenic proof testing but it won't enter that phase until electrical, hydraulic, and plumbing installation is complete. The bigger change this time is how SpaceX is handling COPVs. After a COPV failure on Booster 18 triggered a destructive test explosion, SpaceX started proof-testing COPVs individually at Massey's under flight-like conditions before installing them on ships and boosters. This upfront screening helps catch weak units early and reduces the chance of another major failure during ground testing. Overall, SpaceX is slowing down just enough to validate critical systems early, reducing test risk and pushing Starship toward true rapid reusability. At Launchpad 2, ground system construction continues toward operational readiness. The orbital launch mount is largely complete, and most of the surrounding scaffolding has been removed, with only limited remaining sections near the top for final integration. One of the last major missing hardware items, the protective access doors for the 20 booster hold-down clamp arms, has now been fully installed. These doors close after liftoff to protect clamp mechanisms from exhaust impingement, debris, and extreme thermal exposure. Progress is also continuing on the ship quick disconnect arm, which supplies propellants, gases, power, and data connections during launch preparations. The arm recently received its extension section containing the ship quick disconnect mechanism. Teams are now integrating the fluid lines, electrical harnessing, and control interfaces between the arm and extension to form continuous supply paths from the tower to the vehicle. Once integration is complete, the system is expected to enter full-scale movement testing, including extension and retraction trials of the main QD plate. Catch arm work is also advancing. Crews are installing supplemental bumper structures to prevent uncontrolled contact between arm ends and the vehicle during final translation prior to capture reducing the chance of structural damage during landing operations. Hydraulic actuation adjustments are underway in parallel, and the arms are already undergoing horizontal movement tests to validate the upgrades. At Pad 1, demolition continues as SpaceX reshapes the site to match the newer Pad 2 architecture. The original launch mount was demolished weeks ago, 
debris was cleared, and crews began removing the remnants of the water-cooled steel deluge plate and breaking apart the concrete pile caps using heavy excavators. With the pile caps removed, the site has been backfilled and graded to create a stable working surface, while deep foundation piles remain buried below. Next comes selective excavation for a Pad 2-style flame trench and new foundations. As excavation progresses, any deep foundation piles that interfere with the flame trench will be cut down or cropped as needed, while the rest remain in place. At Massey's test site, the new test jig under construction on the static fire stand has clarified its likely function. Early speculation suggested it might support Block 3 orbital refueling hardware validation via a docking and propellant transfer interface. That was a reasonable guess, since orbital refueling is a major upcoming milestone and will require extensive ground validation. However, the structure kept growing beyond the height of the refueling port and eventually reached the forward flap level, after which a horizontal platform was installed between the two vertical elements. At the same time, SpaceX began preparing the same chopstick test simulator hardware previously used during Test Tank 16 squeeze tests. That earlier campaign was designed to simulate the mechanical loads Starship would experience during a tower catch. This time, the hardware appears intended to integrate with the new platform through a hydraulically actuated load system. The most likely purpose is structural validation of the landing pin interface under flight-like catch loads. The landing pins beneath the forward flaps form the primary load path into Starship's structure during a tower catch. During capture, these pins must transfer essentially the full vehicle weight into the tower arms, along with additional dynamic loads from alignment errors and transient impacts. If the interface deforms, cracks, or tears out, ship recovery fails. Hydraulic rams can replicate these conditions by applying controlled compressive and off-axis loads through the pin region, allowing engineers to measure deformation, validate structural margins, and identify weak points before risking flight hardware in an actual mid-air capture attempt. Finally, hot-stage ring structural testing is also taking shape at Massey's. A two-ring stainless steel aft skirt test article has been stacked above the integrated hot-stage ring on test tank 19 after which a can crusher cap was installed on top. Teams are now connecting the cap to the test stand's hydraulic rams using rigging slings and load lines. The system will soon apply flight-like vertical compression through the stacked assembly, squeezing the integrated hot stage ring between test articles. This simulates the real structural environment during flight, where the ring experiences axial loads from the vehicle stack, dynamic forces during liftoff, ascent, staging, and additional transients from engine ignition events during hot staging. If the ring shows deformation patterns, stress concentrations, or joint weaknesses, SpaceX can update the design while it is still in the test iteration cycle, rather than discovering those issues in flight. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. SpaceX has kicked off a new rideshare format called Twilight, launching on January 11th from Vandenberg Space Force Base aboard a Falcon 9. Unlike the Bandwagon series, which typically targets mid-inclination low-Earth orbit, and the Transporter series, which focuses on sun-synchronous orbit, Twilight is designed specifically to deploy payloads into a sun-synchronous dawn-dusk orbit at roughly 500 to 600 kilometers altitude. This orbit tracks the day-night boundary, keeping solar illumination conditions relatively stable year-round, useful for spacecraft that benefit from consistent lighting and predictable thermal cycling. On this first Twilight mission, SpaceX carried 40 payloads and followed a carefully sequenced deployment plan, releasing satellites starting about one hour after liftoff and completing deployment over the next 90 minutes across multiple burns and coast phases. At the heart of the mission's scientific payload were three NASA-sponsored spacecrafts. Leading the trio is Pandora, a 325-kilogram spacecraft under NASA's Astrophysics Pioneers program. Its mission is to improve the accuracy of exoplanet atmospheric observations by separating true atmospheric signals from stellar contamination during planetary transits. Pandora carries a 45 centimeters Cassegrain telescope with a beam splitter that routes visible light to a photometer for precise brightness measurements, and near-infrared light to a spectrograph to measure wavelength-dependent absorption features from the planet's atmosphere. By measuring brightness changes and spectral features simultaneously, Pandora can correct for distortions caused by star spots and faculae, which often mimic or hide atmospheric signatures. In simple terms, Pandora acts like a dedicated noise filter for exoplanet studies. 
Over its one-year primary mission, Pandora plans to observe at least 20 transiting exoplanets with long repeated observations up to 24 hours per session, multiple times per target, to extract cleaner atmospheric data. This supports studies of atmospheric composition, including water-rich atmospheres, hazes, cloud layers, and other key chemical fingerprints. Complementing Pandora was Black Cat, a six-unit CubeSat designed for high-energy astrophysics. It monitors transient X-ray sources, such as flares from supermassive black holes in active galaxies, and detects events like short gamma-ray bursts, often linked to compact object mergers and associated gravitational wave detections. By capturing these short-lived events from low Earth orbit, Black Cat helps refine our understanding of black hole accretion and the most energetic cosmic explosions. The third NASA payload was SPARKS, another six-unit CubeSat, designed to study how stellar activity affects planetary habitability. SPARKS monitors about 20 low-mass dwarf stars in the near and far ultraviolet over roughly one year, tracking flares and high-energy outbursts. UV radiation and particle events from these stars can erode planetary atmospheres, alter photochemistry, and reshape long-term habitability. By measuring the star's UV output directly, SPARKS provides key inputs for models that predict what an exoplanet atmosphere should look like without life, reducing false biosignature claims. Beyond NASA's three astrophysics payloads, Twilight also carried a broad range of rideshare satellites across categories including Earth observation, communications, and IoT connectivity, technology demonstrations, in-orbit manufacturing experiments, and space domain awareness payloads for tracking objects in orbit. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.